text him about 4.30 and asked him if he knew it, and he bled it. Because it kind of fit into the closing uh, of Revelation tonight as we get into this last segment before we go to the uh, letters to the churches. And I want to ask you, do you believe that is a now thing for you? Do you believe redemption is with us? That we have a king of kings, that we have a Lord that sits on his throne, and that he has paid the price for the redemption of mankind. As we look at this last part of Revelation tonight, I'm going to, I'm looking at the time here, and I'm going to stay with this until I get through it tonight. So if you get close to seven and I'm not done, it won't be, it won't be too long past that, I assure you. Maybe I'll be able to get through it a little faster. I want you to know that chapter 22, that this chapter is a now time. It is a now time. That is the reason that the angel said in Revelation 22, he said, still not the sayings of this book of prophecy. The question is why? He said, because the time is at hand. It was then, by the grace and the assurity of what we have learned about, the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ, that it was definitely at hand. The city was built then. The throne was established then. Christ sat on his throne then. The river of the water of life flowed from the throne then, and it bore its fruits then. We also have learned in Revelation that the leaves were for the healing of the nations then, and whosoever would hear and believe could drink of the water of life then. So I say, blessed is the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who still now sits on his throne. Amen. When we think about it, the city, the river, the tree of life are ours, and the invitation is being sent out now, as it has ever been. Whosoever will may come and take of the water of life freely. Amen. The established church, the new Jerusalem, the city of the living God is fulfilled and fortified and gave glorified million are singing the song that we just got through singing. Redemption, sweet song by the river of life. Even as Israel, and go back into some Old Testament with you here, even as Israel waited for many years to enter into the promised land, they finally entered it with joy and gladness. So also did the saints enter into the kingdom with great joy. When John the Baptist was preaching the wilderness, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He did not mean at hand was in the future because Jesus Christ, he even talked about how the kingdom was at hand then. And we know that the kingdom has been done, that the kingdom has come, and we know that the kingdom is the church, and it is also that that has been promised to us. In fact, at the entrance into the promised land, God gave Israel a solemn warning, and it's given in Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 2, as I read. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Now notice what it says in the Old Testament as I relate it to the last part of this chapter. You shall not add unto the word I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And then also in Deuteronomy 4.13, just a few verses down below, 
It says, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of, sp of stone. God does not want man to ever believe that he has the prerogative of changing God's word. It is not within man that walketh to direct his steps. And God gave this solemn warning in the closing verses of this particular part that we know as the revelation in this book of prophecy. Let's look at what it says in Revelation 22, 18 through 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. That's talking about Revelation. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy, the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book. Now I only try to use the word awesome for God. I try not to use that word unless I'm talking about God, I'm talking about Christ, or I'm referring to the Holy Spirit. <coughs> but how awesome are these words? Follow with me if you would. First, how grave is the responsibility is placed upon the shoulders of anyone who would teach them. Number two, how terrible is the punishment for any change or addition to their sacred meaning. Number three, what a curse is imposed upon anyone who would take away from their inspired contents. Number four, the eternal wrath from heaven will be brought down upon any who tampers with the spiritual truths written within this sacred book of prophecy. And also five, the destructive plagues of wrath written within will be inflicted upon those who dare to come short or go beyond its God-given words. Number six, they shall die a death that never ends. Number seven, they will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Number eight, their name shall be removed from the Lamb's book of life. Nine, they shall be afflicted with incurable plagues. And ten, cast into a lake that is burning with fire and brimstone, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. I want you to notice as we wrap up this book, however, this is not the greatest tragedy to be brought upon the violators of this passage. I want you to notice that every Christian is commanded to teach the eternal truths written in the book of this prophecy. It's right there before your eyes. To refuse to teach them as the commands of God is nothing short of taking away from God's book of prophecy. And to ignore it <coughs> is to make light of it which is blasphemy. We cannot escape the necessity of teaching it. It must be taught. It must be taught correctly, nothing added, and nothing taken away. That is what it entails. John was instructed to write it, and he was instructed to send it to the churches. And these epistles were to be read before the churches, and Jesus said in 22 and 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angels to testify unto you, that's plural, these things in the churches. And what did the angel told John in 22 and verse 10? He said, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He also told John in Revelation 1 and verse 3 to write it for us to read and receive a blessing from reading it. And then he tells John at the end of chapter 22, a curse 
will rest upon anyone who changes its sacred contents, pro or con. And we will do well to notice that these truths are stated in this book. I want you to notice that they may not be ignored without suffering the curse this state in verse 18 and verse 19. Now notice what the angel said. The angel said the time is at hand. Is it not a perverse teaching to make it a future event? I want to ask you tonight, how can a true teacher say that these things have not yet come to pass without taking away from the book? Jesus said the time is at hand. Was it at hand? Can we teach it is yet to come to pass without changing the content of the book of prophecy? I say, of course not. The millennium was a part, much a part of the prophecy that was at hand as any other part of the book. Jesus said it is and was at hand. It began then. So I ask you, can we teach it yet in the future without contradicting the Lord who said it is at hand? I want you to know that no teacher of the Bible can truthfully say the millennium is in the future and believe Jesus when he said it is at hand. Not to believe it was at hand over 1900 years ago is to disbelieve Jesus. It is to take away from its sacred contents and add it and add to its inspired teachings. The millennial reign or millennium is the reign of Christ over both the Jew and the Gentile. And we know that the reign was being set into motion when John wrote the book. Now the time of his writing must have been between 63 and 68 AD. I ask you tonight, in 63 and 68 AD, was Christ on his throne? Was the river of life flowing from it? Was the tree of life, was it growing and producing fruits every month? Were the nations being healed by the leaves of, of it then? Because the time was at hand. I ask you also, were the new heaven and the new earth at hand? I tell you, yes. They were, or Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the angel falsified their statement. They said they were at hand. They were at hand as the kingdom of God and of Christ. Remember when we discussed way several scriptures back, several chapters back, we talked about in Haggai 2 and 6 that the old heaven and the old earth had been shaken, and therefore we were receiving a kingdom that could not be shaken. And how many times have I talked to you about Revelation 11, 15, where it says, I quote, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. What did the angel say? It said, do not see it, said the angel. It is at hand. The theory of a millennium after this age is nothing short of a denial of the words of Jesus who said the time is at hand. And then it tells us in this book that all the curses written within this book will come upon those who teach such. Now I've tried to think of a question after saying all this that you might have in your mind. And the one that I could think is that someone might ask this, this question. Well, what about the judgment mentioned in chapter 20? Was it at hand? Is it going on today? The answer is yes. It is going on today. It was at hand when it was written. God cannot lie. Well, let me just ask you. Hebrews 9 and 27. Now you answer me. It says it is appointed unto man once to die and after death. The future. Or the judgment. The judgment. Were men dying then when this book was, was penned? Was it at hand then? Were men dying then? Did their judgment come after they died? If this were not so, God could not have separated the righteous from the unrighteous. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8, 
He said the righteous knew to be absent from the body was to be present with who? The Lord. This was made possible because Christ is seated upon his throne. What happens to you and I? The Christian suffers absolutely no death. Death is a vestibule in which you just take off these clothes that you have on and you're going to put on another set when he comes to get you. That's all that death is. Your spirit goes back to God who gave it. He's coming back to pick up those who are still alive and those who have gone on in their, in their soul. He's going to come back and restore that body and he's going to give you some new clothes to wear. It's only a vestibule in which we live in and change clothes and we make ourselves ready for the presence of the Lord. Like the reign of Christ, this process has continued ever since the resurrection of Christ and his enthronement at the right hand of God. And this process will continue until time is no more. When men die, whether it's sea, where they die on this earth, where they die in the sky, and I think we had some that were in a plane crash yesterday or today. After death is the what? They saw it. They know about what the judgment is right after they die. No matter where you are, wherever it may be, they all yield up their dead unto him who sits upon the throne, who is the judge of all men. In fact, in Romans 14, 9, for he is the Lord of the living and the dead. Yet it was at hand then. Just as the book of prophecy said, if we believe Jesus, we must believe it. The judgment is in effect right now. Once you die, you have the judgment. It is only consummated in the resurrection. Let's look, if you would, at 1 Peter 4, verses 4 through 7. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according, according to man in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things, here it is, is at hand. Be sober and watch unto prayer. In John 5, 22 and 28, it says, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. And also in Acts 17 and 31, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath risen him, that's Christ, from the dead. The resurrection of the dead, the giving of eternal life and the reign of Christ are all part of of the kingdom of Christ. Therefore, they were all said to be at hand. John and Jesus and the apostles preached. What did they preach? Repent and believe the gospel, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The beginning was at hand. And the kingdom of Christ, the millennium, the first resurrection, the new heaven and new earth, the new Jerusalem, the throne of God and the Lamb, the river of water of life, the tree of life, all had their beginning on the day of Pentecost. <coughs> they were indeed at hand as well as all things connected are made part of them, even until the thousand years, that is, the reign of Christ expires. There are, however, far too many questions to be asked and answered at the close of this book. And it would be absurd to think that I have covered every question 
that could be asked. But I believe that I have given the purpose of the book and the theme of John's writing. I believe that I have tried to do it with you in a simple way and with full proof according to the scriptures by giving you a multitude of scriptures to back it up. I don't believe that I've also failed to make an argument on every point that I have established just as I would have made an argument on every point if it had been Acts or one of the epistles if we were studying it. I also do not believe that this book, the book of Revelation, is to be toyed with. Neither is it to be made a ground for speculation of various religions. I believe that it is confirmed that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, that it was, as we talked about in Revelation 1, the taken off cover of Jesus Christ. It is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies that are given to us in Revelation 10 and told of us in Ephesians 3, 5 through 6. I believe it is to testify, according to Colossians 3, 1 through 5, is correct that Jesus Christ has become our Christ, he's become our King, he's become our Redeemer, he's become our resurrection, and he's become our life. And I believe that we may call upon him then as well as now, and he will hear and he will answer our prayers. He will hear, uh, heal our wounds and he will forgive us our sins. Just as John said in John 10 and 28 says, Redeem us from all iniquity, hold us in your hand, and let no man pluck us out. That means that he keeps us in the palm of his hand, the palm of his grace. He keeps us in the hollow of his righteousness. He lets us find peace in the bosom of the infinite and the eternal. And I hope that we that maybe he will quickly come, I uh, pray, and restore us to our native sovereignty. And that he will clothe us once again, if this were it, with the immortality of life. As the saints in this day, the writer of this book of prophecy prayed, even so may all of us. In Revelation 22 and 21 through 22, it says, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And at the end of that verse, the curtain drops. The visions have ceased, and the book of prophecy has ended. Heaven has spoken. You know how many times angels have ministered to the command, and the revelation of Jesus Christ has been confirmed as a reality. Can you hear as it ended as heaven shouts, The Lord God omnipotent reigneth forevermore. Can you see it as it says, the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Men from all over the world, from all nations, are invited to come and partake of the water of life freely, just like they could do it then. And in Romans 7 and 4, we are married to the Lamb. And in Ephesians 5 and 30, we are bones of his bone, flesh of his flesh, and members of his body. And God has completed his plan of salvation. As we look at this book of Revelation, it is the complete theme of what Christ did for us to give us redemption, to give us salvation, and what in the spiritual world and what in the physical world that he had to completely break against and the things that he had to do in order to give us his son and the price that his son paid and all through history what was being done in order to save mankind and save this world. And I've got people today, if you were to ask them, do they want to have salvation, they look at you like you're crazy. 
the price that he paid for every single one of us. There's not a one of us in here that would have done it. If we'd been sinless, we probably would have asked the question, do I have to? And the book of Revelation is the revealing of Jesus Christ and what he did to set us free. And he still today is doing the same thing that was at hand then. He's doing the same thing that is at hand right now. He's saying, whosoever will may come and partake of the water of life freely. But when he leaves that throne, and he comes with those angels in flaming fire, and he comes into the air to pick up those who are left and to pick up our bodies, it's over. The whosoever will can no longer come. The river of life is no longer going to flow for these people in this world. He's going to close that gate. He's going to throw them into a lake of fire. And he's going to give us that new heaven and new earth where we're going to live forever and ever with him. Thank God that you and I had somebody that taught us the precious.